I encourage anybody to go read it, go look at it, go and do your own research. Uh, because when you hear uh, these woke people like the Stacey Abrams and the, um, you know, all of these Democrats and uh, Raphael Warnock's and, you know, Mark Lamont Hills, yes. when they talk about, um, oh, you know, it's just, it's just, you know, this is not being taught in schools and it's just racial sensitivity. And oh, it, it's not. They're teaching their kids to be stuck in these permanent classes. And what it's doing is it's 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 a mindset thing. You are literally telling little black kids that no matter what they do, right. no matter what achievement that they have, no matter what, no matter if they're a believer, a Christian or not, that they are permanently stuck in failure. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the channel. This is The Conservative Take. And today we have Miss Keisha King with us. And you've seen her before on our channel. She's a, a wonderful person. And I just love talking to her because she has so much information to talk to us about. And it reminds me a lot of myself and other people that I've talked to who had the similar story. But I'm going to bring her on here. And uh, I really want to let you give her a warm welcome. So, Keisha, how are you doing today? <laughs> how are you doing? I'm doing I'm doing great, Kyle. Thanks so much for having me. How are you? Oh, I'm hanging in there. You know, like I said before, we got some things going on on this side and I'm trying to work through some issues, but I think now we got it all together and uh, I'm just glad you can schedule yeah. some time with us again to tell us your story and share with us um, what's going on in your life. And because we had so many people comment on what's Keisha doing, what's her story? And I, I try to point her to your channel, but they still want to know more. So I just want to take this opportunity to bring you on and just share what you have to say. Cause I think what you have to say is very, very fascinating. When we spoke on the phone, I was just flabbergasted. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was a good conversation. We do have a lot in common. <laughs> we do. Yes. So, so let me just first start off here by saying, you know, um, well, I'm just start with the, the, the 5,000 foot question here. So from your experience, what is it like, for yourself, I mean, because obviously I hate even saying this, but we're both black people and we're both conservatives. And the first question I get is how Shut and why. <laughs> and, and so I'm going to start off there, right. but I got a lot of things to kind of dig into because I know I sort of know your story, but I want to hear from yourself one more time. Um, where how did you get to the position you're in right now in your life, um, I guess, politically and also, um, well, I guess, politically, I guess. Okay. Yeah. So I always say like, for the most, most black people, you grow up Democrat. Um, you pretty much hear Democrats are for you. Republicans are racist. There's no context to that. There's no evidence. There's no nothing. It's just, that's what it is. You vote Democrat. Um, and I was, you know, in that same boat, I went along with the same thing. Just thought that, um, pretty much believed everything on CNN, MSNBC, thought that, Anything outside of that, um, like any conservative um, channels like Fox or anything else was just, you know, just not true, just, you know, totally false. And so um, right after the 2016 election, I was having a conversation with a family member and we were talking about Black Lives Matter and talking about like, you know, the... Uh, unarmed black men being shot by the police. And just out of curiosity, um, I just said, you know, I'm going to go look up how many black men have been killed by the police as opposed to, um, you know, the, the black on black crime that's in our communities. And, um, and I hate to say that because, you know, everybody's like, well, every community has uh, crime is committed by proximity. It's true. That is true. However, we do have a higher rate of, um, uh, of a crime, you know, a violent crime in our, our communities, you know, and it's just, uh, it's an unfortunate fact that, anyway, uh, when I went to see those uh, numbers, I was shocked because I didn't understand. We had a lot of the same things going on um, in 2016, uh, riots and, uh, you know, America's racist, it's pretty much the same thing we had in 2020, but just not as bad. And so I didn't understand when I saw the numbers, it didn't make sense why we were paying attention to that issue 
and not the chronic communities uh, issues uh, when it comes to black people, because clearly that's where we have more of the problem. Uh, if we're going to be talking about problems and addressing them, it seems just uh, common sense to address that because that's where we, we were definitely having more of an issue. Um, and so I, it took me aback. You know, I was just really shocked. I was pissed. I was sad. I was um, angry. Uh, as a lot of different things because I couldn't believe that, you know, as a quote, you know, educated woman and all this stuff, I didn't know this. I had never heard this. It didn't, I, I, I just couldn't believe what I was reading. And um, I kept doing some digging and I came across Dr. Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams, at that point, I mean, my mind was just, it was like blown. I could not believe um, how ignorant I was. You know, I was just really ignorant to history. I was really ignorant to, I was politically ignorant. I, you know, it just revealed just so many areas of where I just did not really know what was going on. And I just thought, you know, I, I better educate myself on this because, um, you know, politically, you know, politics are involved in literally like every single thing you do. Um, and so it just behooves you to know what's going on when you have children, when you own a home, when you, I mean, just living your everyday life. I mean, just so many things revolve around politics. So I kept going down that road of just digging and just being like pissed that I had never heard any of these things. For instance, I never knew that the Democrat Party was a party of slavery. I never knew that they were the party of Jim Crow. I never knew that they were the party of KKK, redlining. Literally, like everything bad that had happened to Black folks, they were the um, perpetuators of it. Like they, it, it was like they're the criminals. They're the right. criminals. And we have been believing that they are the good guys this whole entire time. And so, you know, you know, as you keep digging and they try to tell you that the party switched, you know, so when I started bringing this stuff to my family and I'm like, yo, we're like, this is wrong. We are not on the right side here. We're not looking at this thing the right way. Um, you know, then it was like, oh, the party switched. And so I'm like, so the, so these people who for decades, for centuries, who had been totally against us, just all of a sudden happen to just have a change of heart. <laughs> you know, they, they no longer, you know, see that, you know, or think that, uh, you know, black people are, they think that we're equal at this point. You know, I'm like, that just doesn't make any sense. Right, right, right. And then I did more. Going that, and that. It's not, I mean, it's just, it's, and the more important part happened for me uh, spiritually because after all of this learning and all that, um, God sat me down and spoke to me and said that my my skin color had become an idol in my life. And it was a transformational moment for me. It literally helped me put all of this into perspective and understand what I was really doing because what I was doing was pushing my faith aside and lifting up being black, looking at everything through blackness and, you know, black pride, black girl magic and black, black, black excellence. It's just like, it's ridiculous. And God is not pleased, pleased with that. <laughs> huh? Kangs and queens. Have uh, you heard that? Kangs and queens and yes, which I like, yes. <laughs> no, I hadn't heard it before. Oh, yeah, that, okay. But um, <clears throat> <laughs> the yes, I have. Yes, of course. Yeah, I've heard that, but not the Kang, the Kwine. <laughs> not said that way. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. That's funny. Yeah, that, yeah it's how it's spelled yeah, out. But, so um, <laughs> but, That's um, awesome. Yeah, it, it, it was just such a transformational uh, moment because you know, when, when God shows you something about yourself, that's so true. And it's so, it was such a conviction, you know, um, it just, it totally changed my life. Once I received that and understood that I needed to see myself fully through, through who Christ says I am and not through who society and culture says I'm what I'm supposed to do. 
literally like the shackles of limitation and uh, victimization and freedom. I mean, it just, they just fell away. And I truly was able to experience mm -hmm. a mindset where I felt truly free. And it was, uh, it feels so good. It just feels really good. And so I'm forever grateful um, that God allowed me to go through this because I see so many uh, black folks in particular that are state that we, we you know just still seeing themselves purely through being black and it ha how limiting that is and it's such a stronghold you know it's just such a, a it, it's it's a state of bondage uh not just physically but like spiritually it's a state of bondage it's mentally a state of bondage it's emotionally a state of bondage and um i just i see us being to be manipulated and because we see ourselves through race but it's like press you know we go into like the robotic they know exactly what, what we're gonna do and so um that is like my journey into conservatism i realized that i've been conservative my entire life like i i've i've been the conservative my entire life i just had never uh really cons I, I didn't know i was conservative and so but that's that's my story okay well great well that that sounds awesome because you know I, to me that's that's a very uh similar story in a lot of different ways with one major thing that i noticed when i first talked to you is that for you you didn't leverage anything else other than your own research because most people i've talked to it was something that triggered another reaction whether best friend told them something or some an event happened and showed them or but for you you actually went actually did some research on that and especially considering 2016 when the whole thing about trump was president and the whole climate was was anti-trump anti-republican anti-conservative but through all that you still found the wherewithal to do some own research i thought that was the most profound thing and to me personally that speaks a lot to you as a person as a person who regardless of what the regardless of what the story is you want what's true and you, you're willing to deal with that truth and accept it and then go with it and change your life if necessary because the questions i have here really for you are related to what happened after that like for instance like you mentioned about you know i think you talked about your family so you said something about you may you may mention that you said hey what's up you know you guys do you see what's going on here what was their reaction when you actually present them the information that you had found them that to you Said you, or you said you were shocked, you were angry, and you had all these emotions going on. So I'm assuming you expected them to have the same kind of reaction. What was their reaction when you gave this kind of information to your family members and friends? Um, it wasn't what I thought it would be. I thought they would be like, yes, oh my gosh, this, is, this makes so much sense. Well, thank you, Keisha. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this to us. Uh, no, that was not the response. <laughs> It was like, girl, you done drank the Kool-Aid. Oh God, like, you know, gotta lay hands on her and, you know. Um, yeah, I thought they would just be just so much more um, welcoming of that, you know, those ideas. And just because we're naturally conservative anyway, like my entire family is conservative, they are. Their values do not align with the Democrat party at all, but they vote that way. And they think anything that when you try to, uh, say anything against that they, it, it's not just my family i see so many black people we have this weird um just extraordinary unusual uh, hold to the democrat party it's like it, it's like uh we, we just won't let it go oh it's no matter what we see it, it's odd it is an odd weird um <laughs> It's it's a piece I mean, at the end of the day, you're literally just like it, it's a D or an R beside your name, like as far as like politically it's concerned. But the that implication to most black people is just so it, it's internalized, just like you just don't do that. It's really, really, really weird. Yeah, I find that too. And so the funny thing, the first thing you said was drink the Kool-Aid, but they don't know anything about Jim Jones and what he did with the, the Kool-Aid, mostly black congregation that killed themselves. 
who happened to be a socialist and a Marxist. So I find that very fascinating when they use it. Work. My family members, you know, they know about um, they know about these cults. They know about these kinds of things, and it it that's what I'm saying. It's a weird, unusual tie that you know a lot of our families have to the Democrat Party. Yeah, and and so and so with the strange tie to blacks in Democrat Party. I, I know where it comes from, and I think you do too. Can you explain to our viewers? Because I got to speak to my audience too, because I have to ask questions that they would probably ask, and some people just don't understand. So, can you, in basic English or basic English, I guess, duh, in basic terms, what that tie comes from? Because I, I think I know, but I want to know what you think about that because it's so ingrained in our culture right now. Yeah, I think it comes from several things. I think it comes from the Margaret Sanger infiltration into the black church with Planned Parenthood. I think that is a huge thing because it wasn't just them introducing the ideas of abortion and contraceptives and all of those things. It was the, um, the money that came behind that. It was the influence that came behind that. Um, I think that's one thing. I think that the 1964 Civil Rights Act being passed by a Democrat president, even though he was staunchly racist, uh, the spin and the media and marketing on that was brilliant because uh, here we are today still believing that, you know, the Democrats are actually for us. Um, and I also believe that uh, as far as the Republicans are concerned, once they realized that they couldn't really get into the black community anymore. Like they stopped trying, they gave up and, um, you know, they would try here and there, but they never really challenge the Democrats, um, on their policies. They never really just like went in and said, Hey, this is crap, um, for, for decades. And so that, you know, that's a big issue. Um, let me think what else, um, just also in our families, that, that legacy of that tradition of just voting Democrat has been, um, passed down instead of, you know, parents saying like, okay, you know, vote who, you know, go and, go and study and look and see who, who, what side you fall on. You know, we don't teach our children to like think about and consider both sides. We teach them to look at one side. And that, I mean, we don't, I don't know anything that we would do that with, you know, when it comes to something like this, you know, you would always tell your kids, you know, don't judge a book by its cover or, um, you know, just typical cliches and things like that, that we would tell our, our children and family about other things. But when it comes to this, it's like, nope, vote Democrat. That's it. No questions asked. And so those are the top things um, off the top of my head. Um, but what do you think? I, I would I agree. Everything you said. I didn't know that first one. That, that's 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 astonishing, and it makes me even more angry. You know, Margaret Sanger already gets my blood boiling to begin with. But right. I think you I think you nailed it um, perfectly. Um, I, I would I would add to that. I would go back to maybe in the '30s when we were voting Democrat, Republican, and then we had that situation with. Um, with um great depression right, FDR, right. fdr comes in he's basically yeah. you know, he's whatever and so they had this guy who's a pittsburgh chronicle editor i forget his name at the moment i did a video on this guy a couple years ago this guy basically was like you know we need to turn our turn lincoln's picture to the wall and embrace the democratic party and so we enter into a forged in deal essentially when the democrats were giving us these set asides and handouts to to live. I mean, people were starving. So people had to make a determination. Each family had, each family had to decide, am I going to do this? Am I going to get in bed with the Klan so I can maybe have a job and eat? And so right. and so overwhelmingly, blacks turned to the Democrat Party. And mm -hmm. since Truman on, it's been pretty much from there. But then I think you've nailed it when it, it get it when it ingrained in there from a cultural standpoint. You talked about how you know, Margaret Sanger, and it wasn't just the abortion thing that killed off billions, but also it was the money getting in there, as well as the GOP. We can't we can't discredit them. They basically dropped the ball outside of maybe a Jack Kemp who tried McInroads, maybe a Ken Melman under Bush tried a little bit, 
but mm-hmm. it's, it's far, it's far, far gone. And then right. you mentioned the, 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 just the passed down nature. Oh, and also I can't forget the '64 um, Civil Rights Bill, which, mm-hmm. which, which they want to they want to talk about. Go, uh, go was it? Uh, go, Goldberg? No, that's um, the Libertarian oh, uh, Barry Goldwater. Goldwater, thank you. He actually he actually opposed '64, but he approved the two before that. Right. Mm-hmm. So they I want to. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. So I, I think we're I think we nailed it. Yeah. I think we got the, all the bases covered there. So, yeah. and it's, it's, it's so if you, to you viewers out there who who don't understand why <laughs> we without fault go there, it, it's that that's why. And I think Trump did a really really good job of um, of kind of breaking some of those inroads by just telling oh, the truth. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, um, speaking of Trump, I kind of before I get into Trump, I know you're a singer. I would get into that a little bit later and uh-huh. stuff he did with that in the GOP, and that's really exciting. But in terms of mentors, uh, we talked about family, and they didn't really like the idea. You know, you're drinking the Kool Aid and so forth. But were there any mentors along the way that kind of inspired you, or and if he, if they did, are they? Well, I don't want to call anybody out, but are they still on board with you, or how's that looking in terms of personal mentors, people you looked up to? So when I was uh, 19 years old, um, I met my spiritual father, who he passed away uh, last year. Um, Sorry, but. Uh, thank you. He taught me how to read the Bible. I think this is key because I never understood like why God would lead me down the road of politics like that. Like I had no desire to like work in politics. I had no desire to like, okay, I found this new information. Okay, nice. You know, cool. Great. But I did not have a desire to like work in politics or do anything like that. But I kept just feeling God pushing me in this direction. And I think the thing, when I look back over my life, I think one of the foundational um, moments, I guess, or foundational tools um, that allowed me to even be open to thinking this way was because my spiritual father taught me how to read the Bible. So it wasn't just like, okay, here's this scripture, here's that scripture. He always taught me to um, think about when, when, whatever, when the scripture was being written, like at what, like what else was going on in history, so you can put it in proper context. Who was saying it, and the crowd that they were saying it to. And so I think that that foundational thinking. Um, influenced me throughout my life in many different areas. And so when I started to think about um, politics and questioning like, okay, what is this and how do we do it? I had to start thinking kind of like, okay, who are they talking to? What was going on at the time? Um, you know, sort of a, a contextual, um, contextualizing these ideas because I don't think if I had had that, those tools of critically thinking I wonder if I would have been able to process and understand what I had um, stumbled across, and or even if I would have even been of the right mind to even ask the question, to go do the research. But um, I think that is probably one of the main things that um, I can see God placing him in my life to you know, orchestrate this this process to where I am today. And that that is like really foundational. When I was coming up with questions for you to talk to you about, that's a new question I haven't answered ask anyone. And I was like, that's not really a good question, but I'm gonna put it down here anyway. And I kind of forced it in there because I thought, you know, let me just ask it because it sticks on my list. But I'm so yeah. glad I asked that question. And it may may have God may have moved me there ask that question because to me you totally hit something right on the head there with that critical thinking the mentorship the fact that if we don't if you didn't have that and you don't even know if you even could have made that jump to conclusion mm-hmm. and we could probably go another hour and a half just on that whole thing in and of itself i don't want to do that you know wherever we decide to do that would be great because i think that's a, something we can really open okay. up maybe maybe make a forum discussion okay. or something um because to me okay. um that's so important because I think, oh, this is so, this is so huge. Cause it's like, it's like when you're trying to uh, convey a message, it's just like you talk to people, you can just see the lights are off, right? A lot of times the lights right. are just off and there's 
And I talked to another gentleman uh, on here called, his name is, um, he goes by um, Conservative Guy. He's got a really big channel. He's on, yeah. he's on Brand Tater. Oh, you know him? Okay. Cool yeah. dude. He told me, he said, you know what? My big brother told me. He said, he, he told me, think for yourself, dude. You know, think, you know? And it's like, and I think, going back to myself, it's, I also had a mentor in high school, um, mm -hmm. a doctor, Professor Lair. I say it now, I don't care. He basically said, always choose a position. It was right or wrong, be able to defend that position. That's over 30, 40 years. <clears throat> Did I say that? <laughs> That's a long time ago. Um, <laughs> So anyway, I, I want to just commend you for for, for for saying that because that, that to me is something that uh, it, it goes without saying, and sometimes people just don't um, really, really um, weigh that enough into this whole discussion. So, yeah. So anyway, thank so, you. oh, you thank you absolutely. So um, so anyway, that happens to you. Your family, you know, kind of they love you and everything, but they kind of say, oh, that's just Keisha, or whatever. Um, yeah. Anyway. So next, you know, to their despair, I'm sure. All of a sudden, you're golfing. To, you're also some other things too. You're involved in groups and clubs and singing places. And can you share with me what's the next step on along? What happened after that? So, um, I mean, just I guess the kind of person that I am, like I felt like I had to do something. I felt like I needed to inform um, other people, other Black folk, like, yo, this is not like this is not. You don't want to keep voting for this because you're voting against your va you're voting against your own self-interest and i didn't want you know if i could help people to not do that you know i felt like i should probably that would be the right thing to do um so i just started getting involved with the republican party like i just called them up one day and i was like hey you know you guys <laughs> like when are you having another when are you having a meeting and they were super nice and i went and was a little nervous pulling up and, you know, because after all my whole life, I had told that these people hated me and they were like super racist. But once I got in there, oh, and I remember too, like I wore blue that day. Like I was like, oh my God, they're going to think I'm like a undercover, like Democrat. <laughs> but it was like, 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 like you were, um, like, like you were blood or something going into East LA. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> exactly. Sorry, Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Um, but they were super nice and then um, got involved with the Jacksonville Young Republicans and became the director of communications uh, because uh, my education background is in marketing and that's just, you know, a way that I felt like I could best um, utilize my skills. And uh, the opportunity came along to work with the RNC with Black Voices for Trump and I was like, heck yeah. So I took that opportunity and it was tough, you know, it was a really, really tough job, grueling grassroots campaign work, you know, but it was really a great experience. And out of that, um, I, the word got around that I used to sing and um, I was asked to sing the national anthem when uh, President Trump came to Jacksonville, Florida, uh, did that and then did three other rallies um, after that. So it just, was just an amazing experience and um you know just totally unexpected to I, I mean i couldn't have written <laughs> you know that story I, I i would never have expected for my journey into our politics to you know involve me singing the national anthem for the president of the united states i mean what an incredible you know opportunity i was like you know, there are like twenty five to fifty thousand people at all of these rallies. I'm like, Beyonce, hello, somebody, because I'm like sitting in front of crowds of, you know, the size of famous huge singers. Like I just it was just amazing, you know. Just really just an honor. Yeah, yeah. And the um and, and the, the the thing about that is if you juxtapose that against a Beyonce concert. They're there. A lot of them are there for the music, and I'm not doubting her talent or anything like that. They're being there because they like her too. But the people that you're singing in front of, of course, they're there to see Trump. I'm not trying to say they aren't. Oh yeah. Every last one of them generally love you. Generally love you, and each each one of them generally love each other. Why? Because we all support this country, and we're all bound by the same ideas of this country. And so, if you yeah. love those ideas. As conservatives, we love you by default. Now you may do something mm 
say something stupid on Twitter or something, we'll, we'll like, you know, you kick you around a little bit. But at that moment, you know, it's, I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like, because we don't even know you, but at the same time, we just we give you the benefit of the doubt. If you see you love America, you're on board. We're on board with you. Right. Um, and so I think that is, is cool. And the fact that you say before the president three times, I mean, come on. And, and then to say, you know, you can, I, I think really analytical here. Here you are thinking you're wearing this blue. I'm not sure you are blue. You went to this Republican rally or this Republican thing, and like you, like me, my first one, I was terrified. And you're going in there. You know, oh my goodness, this is gonna be terrible. Next thing you know, you're sitting in front of the president. You know, a few months later, you know, that to me, that if that doesn't tell you anything about conservatism and what we're about, nothing, nothing will. Nothing will. Right. Of course, yeah. they'll still say, well, she's just being a token. He just cared because she's uh, black. Of course, right. you get that, right? But at the same time, if, if, if Obama or even Biden, for that matter, asked me to do something for him, I probably wouldn't do it now. Mm-hmm. But I'd probably ask, and I probably would, if it was a genuine type thing, I probably would do it out of respect of, of, the, of the office and everything else. Because yeah. that's just, you know what I'm saying? But at the mm-hmm. same time, um, but see, we can do that, but the other side will never, never entertain anything like mm-hmm. that. Whatsoever, because their hatred is mutual, you know. And so, anyway, I'm getting up. Yeah. I'm digressing here. So, <clears throat> so let me let me back a little bit. I know people are going to want to hear this. So, I, you kind of you kind of downplaying it, but what I'm saying, what you did was freaking awesome. All right, <laughs> thank <laughs> you. Awesome. So I got to dive in a little bit more. I got to dive in just a little bit more. All right. So I played in the band. I played in front of fans, people. Maybe at the most, I played maybe maybe a couple hundred at a festival. You're about how many times that. What was it like when you? Well, let me ask you this question. What was it like when you first got the call that you're going to do it, and then we'll go from there. Um. So okay. So I used to sing the anthem, uh, for, like in high school for at like our football games, our basketball. I was like, the, you know, I used to sing the song all the time, and I, I, when they asked me, and after I just, I after I came and my feet got replanted on solid ground <laughs> after realizing like what I was going to do. Um, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe all these years I've been singing the song, never realizing that one day I would be singing, you know, for the president of the United States. I mean, I just could not believe that this was happening to me. And um, it was just incredible. It, it was so incredible. So I, I just, you know, I, I, I knew I could do it because, you know, I had done this before in front of, you know, like a pretty good sized crowd at football games um, and things. And, and I think I had, I, I'm saying it like for some minor league football and baseball and, you know, just different. I've just sang the song a lot. Um, but I was extremely nervous because right before I go on, I meet Governor DeSantis, who's the governor in Florida. I meet his wife. They are just (laughs) lovely, beautiful people. I meet, like, I'm backstage with uh, Representative Matt Gaetz. Um, Just meeting, oh, and Kat Kamek was back there, Representative Kat Kamek. Um, Who else? Just, you know, tons of people. And, you know, it, it was the, the, the magnitude, you know, was really there, you know. And then once I got on the stage, and I think I said something like, uh, let's keep America great or four more years or something like that. And the crowd just <laughs> went absolutely nuts. It, it was so, <laughs> it was just so amazing. Oh. And then, they were just so, they were just so for me, you know, I mean, they were, they were so in it, you know, the energy was incredible. I have never sang in front of a crowd that had that great of energy. It was, it was dope. It was like yeah. high low. I mean, it's what any artist want. That's the feedback you want to get. Like before yeah. you even have a note, before you even have a note, <laughs> They didn't even know if I could actually sing. You know? right, right, right. Yeah. So, but they were, it was like, regardless, we are here. Like, we're, let's do this. 
So it was, um, man, it was energetic. It was dope. It was like the vibe was crazy. It was great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what, yeah. I was, that's what I was looking to hear because I, I know those rallies were like that. And those people are out there, depending on where you, where, where you were, when you went, it was, they were camping like 10 hours prior to, you know, the game time. Yeah. I, I just want people to understand that. I know we did a show last night talking about the rallies coming back and so forth. So I'm really excited about that. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's, so, so congratulations on that. I, I really Thank don't you. want to un 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 play that because I'm really getting a little emotional here on this one because I really think that's just such an amazing, beautiful uh -huh. story. That no, I'm serious because if you think everything together, where we are in this country and where this country is going, you know, it really, it really, it really strikes me in a lot of different ways. And it's like to hear this makes me really, really, really happy and proud. So, Thank so you. yeah. So let me go to some of the dark side, though. I'm not high note, you know. And we, and we talk about it a little bit. We're gonna add a little darkness, to it. but at the end we're gonna end up we're gonna end on the high note. Sure. What do you know about? And this is a rhetorical question because I know you know about this. What do you know about co uh, critical race theory and 1619 Pride? Mm -hmm. What do you know about that? And what's the impact? Do you see that happening potentially on this country? Oh my gosh. Okay. So critical race theory is racism. It's just racism all prettied up be you know, behind some fancy term. Uh, it started back, I think it started to get some traction like in the 80s. Um, but basically it's just a different, um, spin on Marxism. So, um, it, th the easiest way for me to explain it is it's like a hierarchy system. So critical race theory says if you're, if you fall into these categories, you, you, you that's where you're, you fall in on the hierarchy scale. So if you're white, uh, able-bodied, uh heterosexual man you're at the top and you're the oppressor down from that you get the white straight woman and down from that you get the black straight man and then down from that you get that you know you just it goes down and it literally categorizes you by skin color skin color sexual orientation all these intersectionalities all these identity groups so depending on which identity group you fall in, that's where they put you on the scale and determine where you are in society. And with critical race theory, it, they, they sell it. This is the evil and deceptive part. They sell it as racial sensitivity. Oh, we're just, oh, they, all we wanna do is talk about racial sensitivity. All we want to do is just teach people about the history of systemic oppression in America. It's like, wait a minute. No, that is not what you want to do. You want to tell people, little white kids, if you're white, by no choice of your own, you automatically fall into this category. If you're black, by no choice of your own, you automatically fall into this. If you're gay, if you're straight, if you're, you know, they just, if you're a woman, if you're a man, they put you into these categories. They know nothing about you. Um, so basically, it's like you could be a black person oh. driving in a Rolls Royce, okay? <laughs> Live in a mansion, uh, literally fly to Paris like, for <laughs> lunch, okay? Preach, girl, preach. But you are more oppressed than the white guy who's sitting with a with a sign up that says we'll work for food you're more oppressed than him because you're black and he's white that is how critical race theory works because no matter what he automatic he, he nothing that he does will um remove his white privilege and nothing that you do will remove your oppression you are uh in these category groups indefinitely that is your uh that is your status in society you are an oppressor or the oppressed and um it's utter nonsense <laughs> it is utter nonsense and you have people like oprah winfrey and lebron james and uh you know the people on the breakfast club and just all of these people who will literally 
tell you that they're oppressed because they're black and they're multimillionaires. Right. You know what? I think that's probably the best. <laughs> we need to take that and make it a little thingy because that's that's probably the best explanation I've heard of critical race theory ever. Because you did a video on this, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I think you did a reaction. Did you do a reaction to another person who debated? Yeah, something? I did a right. And I did I want, a reaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that guy didn't really do it justice. He did okay, but yeah. he did you. you the, your criticism was he really didn't define it that well. And yeah, I think he, he did it pretty well. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's crazy. It's racism. It is. And, and you know what? Yeah. I'm glad you. I'm glad you put it that way. You framed it that way because I wasn't really. I guess I kind of knew, but I mean, I, I really didn't. I, I I think I know now because I talk about all the time with, you know, way back when we're dealing with like um, equity of outcome versus equal opportunity mm -hmm. and dealing with like uh, with social justice, which is, I guess is Marxism too, I guess, because all we're talking about is, I would say these arbitrary groups that people put you in that based on what you just said, but now it's really Marxism. It came from Marxism. So the arbitrary yeah. group, it's not arbitrary, it just came from the pit of hell, Karl right. Marx, whatever that was, I guess it was the, 30s, I guess. No, no, 1800s. Late 18, 18, yeah, late yeah. 1800s. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. An old white guy. An old white guy. A he was racist, by the way. He, 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 hated he hated women. I mean, come on. He hated Jews. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was uh, anti Semitic. He was an atheist. He, uh, he, was, he, he had a very troubled um, childhood. And I think that is where these thoughts came from. Like, um, Anyway, but I mean, there's so much more to critical race theory, but that's kind of like the, the sticking points. And um, I, I encourage anybody to go read it, go look at it, go and do your own research. Uh, because when you hear uh, these woke people like the Stacey Abrams and the, um, you know, all of these Democrats and uh, Raphael Warnock's and, you know, Mark Lamont Hills, Yes. When they talk about, um, oh, you know, it's just, it's just, you know, this is not being taught in schools and it's just racial sensitivity. And oh, it, it's not. They're teaching their kids to be stuck in these permanent classes. And what it's doing is it's, it's, it's a mindset thing. You are literally telling little black kids that no matter what they do, right. no matter what achievement that they have, no matter what, no matter if they're a believer or Christian or not, that they are permanently stuck in failure. And wow. it's just the most, it's so evil. It is just an evil, extremely deceptive and it's demonic. It's, uh, it's absolutely demonic. Absolutely. And so, um, you know, I behoove anybody to really go and look and see what these people are actually talking about. Well, I won't. I won't stay on Marxism, but it, it does. It does. You mentioned being an uh, atheist. Yeah, it, it's it's counter. It's totally counterintuitive, or it's total. What's the word I'm looking for? It's the um, antithesis. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. We got that thing going <laughs> of, of Christianity, and so right. um, so yes, yeah, so that that's really, really important. So um, so I lost my train of thought here. Um, so let me ask you this question then. Oh, I, I know it was the. 1619 project is nothing more, and you can talk to this if you like, if you know more about it than I do, which you probably do, is nothing more than a revisionist way of explaining why America was never great. So that they could impose this sort of philosophy. Because if America really was great, you know, in this inception, you know, yes, we had slavery, but we had, you know, 70,000 people, uh, 700,000 people die um, killing, ending slavery. So you had to do something to get rid of that. So if it was always bad, then we can kind of just not worry about everything that happened after that, right? So is that what you right. see is, um, the 1619 Project as being nothing more than a revisionist attempt to invalidate everything America's done from that point forward? Yes. Um, I see the 1619 Project as, yeah, like it's all tied in together. It look, it's, to me, it seems like it's just one big agenda. And they're kind of attacking it from different perspectives. And the 1619 Project, like you said, it, it, it's a it's revisionist history. And when you don't 
tell history in its proper context and in, in what was really going on, um, you're going to really see a lot of people. And I, I don't really understand the motivation because it seems very counterintuitive. I don't know why you would want any nation to hate itself. That doesn't make any sense to me. Like, I, I, I don't understand. <laughs> it, it's silly to me. Like, why would you want to make the people who make up the nation hate the nation that they live in? I mean, that is as divisive and as idiotic, quite frankly, as you can get. Like, you know, you want people to um, love the nation because if if we don't like we're not gonna have one and 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 i'm I, I understand like there are people like let's say in china or who are in truly oppressive um systems government systems no i mean yeah i understand why they don't like where they live but when you live in the united states of america the place where everybody's trying to get to the the most wealthiest and freest nation in the entire world the most powerful nation in the entire world the most you know the most successful um where the most successful black people are made here i mean it's here and for them to like turn that around as if it's something bad it's ridiculous. Every nation has had bad history. Why? Because every nation is built of people and there are bad people. <laughs> you know, that ain't never going nowhere. You're always going to have bad people. And I don't care if every single black, every single woke black person went to go start their own nation. It would be a disaster too, you know, until they got you know, until they learn from their mistakes, until they, you know, realize, okay, we can't really want a society on that kind of thinking. Um, but, but because it's made up of people, imperfect, yeah. flawed people, it's going, I mean, that's just, that's life. So, and that's why, and that's why you have to have that Christian or, or I would say Christian, but others would say other things, but I would say at least a moral based worldview in the sense that the human condition is, is what is that's the, the common denominator, regardless of what political system or what economic system you choose, whether it be socialism or, or capitalism. Um, you still, you have that problem with human people. So right. you, know, you want to get the best system in place to mitigate against us being, you know, us being evil people at times. Right. Um, I, I would personally say inherently evil because I'm, you know, I'm more, you know, told depravity type theological theological kind of person. But you know, I'm not going to get into that kind of, you know. Dogmatic yeah. approach, but just for the sake of argument, like you said, people screw things up, and we got to uh, mitigate um, that action. So, yeah, I, I agree with that. Oh, by the way, I, I want to say because I'm a Civil War guy, I know 70 people didn't die, 828 cal, 828,000 casualties, give or take. So I could still be right there, but I don't want to get any feedback from the uh, from my chat groups. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> So, um, anyhow, you know they'll come for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to say that. So <laughs> it was not the eight hundred twenty thousand, but give or take a few. Um, right. I'm, just, I'm, I'm just, I'm just teasing. But I do give tours, by the way, Gettysburg. So I know I, I want okay. I have people that follow me. So, um, anyway, so let me ask you this question: Do you think right now, and this is kind of a leading question here, uh, do you think this is the biggest problem right now in America? And if it's not, what is the biggest problem going on right now in America? In America? I, I think the biggest problem um, in America is our moving away from God. I think once we decided to come into agreement with abortion, and this is just my opinion, I think in, in the early 70s, you can see this, you know, our society begin the beginnings of the uh, deterioration. And it's so many things that lead to um, where we are now. And most of all of these things are addressed in the Bible. So for instance, if you, like the Bible says, if, um, if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. That's more than just like a nice little scripture. There's so much in that. It is, it, it is a principle of um, reaping and sowing. It's a principle of um, earning what you get. 
it's a principle of um, working hard, you know, and, and what all of those things return. So when you start to move away from a, uh, a merit, I guess, society or just a hardworking society or the notion that you, you know, that things that sh they sh you're just entitled to them and they should just be given to you. Um, it, it's not, it's a biblical thing, but it's also like a universal law. Like, I don't care what color you are. I don't care where you live. <laughs> you know, well, it, it doesn't matter where you live because of the government structures. But if you live in a place like America, if you work hard, you're going to get somewhere. <laughs> like if you sow into something, you will reap. It, it, it is a universal principle that God has set up. He set it up that way. Like <clears throat> you don't have to be a Christian to reap the benefits of God's principles. Um, they just exist. It's just like gravity. You don't have to believe in science, but gravity is still going to work. <laughs> Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, so it, it's just one of those things where it's like it's a universal principles. If we when, once we started to move away, th those principles are are directly tied to God, in my opinion. And um, they, it, when you start to move away from them, it, you're you're moving away from logic. You're moving away from thinking. You're moving away from uh, just just common sense. And I, I think that is the beginnings of where we really start to unravel. And you can see around that whole time, like prayer is being taken out of schools. Abortion has become legalized. You see, you know, breakdowns of the family on so many different levels, well, welfare. And you, know, you see a rise of um, uh, marriages that aren't, biblically the biblical standard of marriage and you you just start to really see just these different uh changes that deteriorate society and i think that is the biggest um issue in um, in america uh I, yeah that's a great answer i, I can't agree 100 i can't agree more than that i, I think you said i 100 agree with you i think you've nailed it on every single point making my, my questions difficult here <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing. You know, it's, it's awesome because I mean, I think everything you said, I'm I'm 100% spot on. Agree with you. Um, Thank you. I just, you know, I just, um, it's almost like if you have a laptop computer, right, and you you have an instruction manual, okay, mm -hmm. and you, know, you, you toss it out, you toss it out, you don't read it, whatever, or you look at it, I don't need it, right? And you're eating around the computer, you're in the bathtub with it, you, you know, you go s snowboarding with it, you know, you're out in a dune buggy with it, you're out on the beach with it, whatever. And you wonder why it's not working, or, or you know, it's not, it's not doing what it, it's, it's it's functioning a little bit, but it's just not where we where it used to be, right? Right. Well, that's true. Like it's just kind of said, God set things in motion. He put these different rules and laws and and things that are just you know like you, know, you don't work, you don't eat, you know, because we're all living a fallen world now. So um, and we deviate from that. All of a sudden, our computer isn't working quite as well as it used to be until it just stops not working at all. Um, right. So that to me just makes perfect sense. I think people just don't get that because they're still coming at it from this six billion years old creation or Big Bang creation, and we're just a random collection of, of cells moving through the universe, you know, at a billion miles a second, um, with no randomness, randomness all around us, with no purpose. Mm -hmm. So, what do you expect a child who lives in that kind of environment to think? We expect that person to, you know, to, to to aspire to be, you know, in in it's just a, a spiritual thing too. And I think right now yeah, we're at the point now where the gloves are off, right? You know, the Republican party, like you said before, kind of ignored the problem and a lot of Christians ignored the problem. And so when then the Floyd thing happened and, and everything came into, in, into like right in front of everyone's faces, they had ignored it for so long. The computer is totally not working now. Now how do I fix it? Right. And it's like, right, right. it's very reactionary. So now, Oh my gosh, am I really a racist? It, 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 could I have prevented this? Self doubt, self guilt. Christians, you know, get um, kicking out other family members, break down in the family, even exasperate more because there's no structure to keep it intact anymore. Mm -hmm. And so now the country just starts, it's on fire because it's been ignored for so long. And then when something like that happened, boom, here we are. Right. right. Um, mm -hmm. So, 
yeah, so I'm gonna leave it right there. Unless you have anything to say on that, I'm gonna try and get to the, something a little less, uh, <laughs> a little less depressing. Um, <laughs> no, that's <laughs> it. Um, but I will say this you know, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a good note. I think that we can get out of this if we number one fix voter uh, integrity, and mm -hmm. people will come to the senses because they realize this isn't working, and they will vote the opposite of that if we can get the right people in. I think that will happen. I think we'll. I think this is maybe a, a, a shot to our system. Say, hey, that's not right. We let's overcorrect again back to where we were prior to right. um, this vision coming in. So, yeah, absolutely. So, well, cool. So we got a few more minutes here. I just want to ask you a couple, uh, couple of questions, generic more or less. Um, so, growing up, you know, in, in a time, I'm not sure, I'm not going to tell you are, but at some point in time, we could go outside, we could breathe, we could go to a football game, we could, we could do picnicking, we could do whatever you want to do. Um, America wasn't perfect, but it was different in, in my way, and not, not a way, it's a lot better than what it is now based on what we can do in our society. Um, do you have a favorite memory growing up of, of, of what really made you, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter, what made you really love this country, a, a moment in time that you can um, think off the top of your head, which uh, made you really appreciate this country? Um, so my father was a Army veteran. Um, so we always had a lot of respect for America, um, which is weird seeing how my family like responds to America now. But anyway, I remember growing up, my mother, we would like, we would watch a movie and if it had like, um, let's say it was like a military movie or something and you would see like the American soldiers coming in. And I remember my mother saying, oh, there goes the Americans, the good guys are here. Like just, you know, c commentating on the movie. And that made me, it, 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 it made me know like, oh, you know, it made me feel good to live in America. It made me feel proud of my country. You know, um, yes, I knew the past of, you know, a lot of the slavery history and all those things. And I knew, um, <clears throat> you know, heard, had heard some of the stories that my own family members had had to go through. Um, but hearing them, that they had gone through those things, but they still knew that America was the better choice. It's like they knew we not, we're not perfect, but we're not Cuba or we're not, you know, Russia, we're not China. Like they knew that right. America was good. Now, it's like those same people have no, they don't, they don't feel those that way anymore. They're just like, they, they feel like America is just a bad place. And, uh, but my, my, one of my fondest memories of, um, you know, uh, of just patriotism, I guess, would be hearing my parents be like, yeah, the good guys are coming when you see like the American flag or like a military, um, helicopter flying in on a movie or something so yeah 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 that's awesome i, I that's awesome i you know what i, I don't really unfortunately I, really, I don't think i really have a, a really proud american moment really i mean um yeah. I, I i mean not that i didn't hate america i was just you know, i was I thought it was okay i was never yeah you know I, mean, I never i never thought much of it you know i, I thought we were like, in the olympics i thought we were doing pretty well but, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I was never really. It was never. We were never at odds with anyone else. I just thought we were better than anyone else. And that was it. Um, so, and I think I think what people forget or don't know is that if you go to a different country, you see pretty quickly how good America really is. And I'll tell a quick story here. A friend of mine, I'll be real quick. He was a consultant down, in, I think it was middle Central America somewhere. Mm -hmm. And this, he told me this several years ago. He said, you know the difference between here and America is when I was down there working working in this in this country? I said, what? He said, when you hear a knock on the door in the middle of the night, you know, in America, you, you, know, you, you may be concerned, but down there, you may, they may be arresting you, taking you to, taking to jail. You may never see family ever again. So that's the difference wow. because, um, and that to me, I was like, wow, that's before I even gone to a different country. Um, so about tw 15 years later, I got a chance to go to Brazil and saw some really, some really horrible poverty where kids mm -hmm. were living running down the street with no, not a stitch of clothes on, um, following us around because their parents were nowhere to be found. They were called street urchins. And they were just there. And they, they took care of themselves in like, in like little packs. Wow. And so um, we don't know anything like that anywhere in this country. 
Nowhere in this country do we have anything remotely close to that. So I don't know. So I think people need to have a little bit more perspective and just give America a break. I mean, <laughs> just give it a break. I mean, just I mean, what what America? What country? Yeah, have I'm about some to gratitude. Have thank you. Thank you. Thank oh, you. I'm sorry. No, no. no I, I if I get if I get going, I'm I'm, I'm not going to stop. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, um. That, that, that's good. So you had a military uh, sort of background uh, influences there. So sounds like to me that you were set up for great things. And so let me ask you a question. Um, so, so for the future for yourself, do you want to, what do you think you're going to be doing now? Of course, the, the campaign is no longer there. Uh, are you still involved with the uh, politics? Are you, are you, I know you have your channel. If you want to talk about that, how that's going or what your aspirations are going forward. Yeah, so I started King Consulting, which is a political consulting company that helps uh, campaigns, uh, conservative campaigns with their elections, uh, with their campaigns r rather, um, do their marketing, uh, so to speak. So helping them brand and understanding why that's important. Um, I think Trump showed us tremendously why branding and approaching things differently is super important right now. And um, I don't think that's gonna change anytime soon. Um, for me, you know, marketing is my my background, and it's <laughs> I haven't had a years of experience in um, uh, politics as much as I've had in, in marketing. But it's the same thing; it's just a different product, <laughs> basically. Um, so I wanted to help conservatives better market themselves to better get the conservative message out there um, to communities that won't typically hear them to or even just in the mainstream um better communicate their ideas because if at the end of the day we have the better product we have i mean these concepts and and values and um uh, ideas have been around for years and they work um they're they're proven um and we just don't do a great job as a party communicating those ideas. We kind of are always on the defense instead of the offense. And so I'm trying to help the party uh, through my consulting company better tell our stories, better tell who we are, what we're about, and how we can help improve the lives of Americans. Yeah, I'm gonna put all your links and contacts there below. I'll probably put a graphic here as well to your, um, to, to your company and everything else. And I, that's going to be successful. That's going to be successful Thank because it, it's unique and you have credibility. Hey, you sang for the president three times, so <laughs> <laughs> that in of itself four times. Yeah, you know, you know, if I had the money to invest in you, I absolutely would, and I, and I still will. Mm -hmm. if I get to that position because I, I may need Thank your you. help as well because I want to make sure that uh, I can be in a position too where I can do the same thing, which is why mm -hmm. I, why the channel exists for the most part. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, so yeah, so I you know I just want to thank you so much for for, for coming on here, and um, I have another question I was going to ask you, but you've sort of already asked that question, answered it, and I typically ask people this question, and it's like if you could have any power to fix the world or the, the society, what would be the first thing you would do? And I think you kind of mentioned that, but you can repeat it if you like. But or, 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 or number two thing you would do, um, if you could just wave your wave your hand and say this is how it's going to be. Or even from a policy perspective, uh, more from a tangible, not, not not a magical or esoteric kind of deal, but even from a policy perspective, what would you do um, to help move us in the right direction to where we can get back to making this country great again, which it was four years ago? I would probably, um, from a policy perspective, I would, this is what I would do. I would make it so, okay, I have two, I have two. The first one would be that the, media, that the media would have to be held to the same standards as us marketing professionals. So marketing professionals, we have laws that we have to abide by. Like you can't lie in ads, right? You can't, um, you know, when you're marketing to children, there are certain laws when you're marketing, it's just, we have laws when, when it comes to the FDA or uh, products and stuff. We have laws that we have to abide by. I would enact a policy that says uh, elected officials cannot lie about bills. 
they have to tell the truth. And if they don't, they will be fined or they will be, uh, you know, there, there will be some type of consequence. Because, for instance, the the voter, the new voter law uh, in Georgia, you know, this was, oh, this is racist. This is Jim Crow 2.0. It's Jim Eagle. It's, you know, it's just the worst thing to happen to black folks. And I mean, literally, it is the furthest thing from the truth. It, is, it was just a flat out lie. And the manipulation that happens when these people, with the, the, these officials with these large voices, with these huge platforms, and then you got the media jumping along, no one can, no one holds them accountable for just spewing this, these laws. Now you got corporations who are moving out of Georgia. People are going to lose their jobs. Like this is not, you know, some some idea. Like these are real people who will really lose their jobs, lose right. their ability to care for their families because y'all are up here talking about some nonsense. You know, just straight up lying to the people. That's a real thing. These are real people. And you should not be able to do that. Just like in marketing, we can't, because they are real people that we can, we have the power to persuade. You can't, uh, you can't abuse that power. And so that would be one of the first things I would do. The media and the officials cannot lie about bills. You have to tell the truth. Now you're going to have to sell it some other kind of way, but you cannot lie about it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. That's, that's, actually easy. that's actually, actually pretty easy to implement, too, actually. Let's do it. <laughs> was there a second one you had? Um, you said there was two, maybe. Oh, term limits. Term oh. limits. Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I th those are two very. The first one, oh, the second one is absolutely very popular, probably extremely popular, but that first one. People don't know it yet, but that's actually popular too, right? Because that's they don't know it yet, but that's really because no one's really talked about that. I don't think I've heard anyone mention that particular policy. Uh, maybe we should edit that part out of it, so you can kind of spring it on them later. But, <laughs> oh, right. but, but no, that's good. It's great. I mean, I think that's awesome. I think that's really easy to do. Just like textbooks in uh, in schools, you know, they have to be accurate. You know, so um, right. I would, I would, mm -hmm. I would, I would do that as well to make sure they're enforced. So. Right. Well, great. You know, uh, Keisha, that was awesome. I think you gave us a lot of good things. We understood a little bit about where you came from, uh, what, you, what you're going, what you're doing, your inspirations. Um, and sing for Trump, man. Come on. Huh? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it gets no better than that right there. So um, <laughs> so that's awesome. Thank you so much for, for coming out here. Uh, is there anything that you want to say uh, in terms of maybe where we can find you or anything else you want to add about your business or what you're trying to do? Uh, on social media or anything like that? Yeah, um, just follow me um, on my YouTube, uh, Keisha King. Follow uh, um, me on Instagram at I am Keisha K and on Twitter at I'm Keisha K. Um, yeah, just follow me. And I'm also on Facebook um, under Keisha King. And yes, it's spelled with a Q, but it's, it's pronounced Keisha. Um, so just follow me and, you know, chat with me and let's connect and see, um, what we can do to keep America great. <laughs> That's great. That's fantastic. Again, those links will be on the description below and, and check out her YouTube channel too. She's doing videos out there maybe once, twice a week. It's really good stuff there. Good nuggets. And, um, go check her out, follow her and by all means, let's support her uh, in our business as well. If you're a candidate, we're coming up here on, on the primaries reach out to her. I know people who are, who are trying to run, reach out to her. I'm sure she, she'll, she'll cut you a deal. You know, maybe, maybe yeah. if she doesn't, um, <laughs> it doesn't matter. You should still reach out to her because I'm sure she can help you and what you're trying to do because obviously the Republican party needs a different direction. I think like you said before, Trump showed us the way to do it. So um, if you're following those footsteps, you can't. Absolutely. All right. So with that, um, I'm going to thank everyone for coming out here. And thank you, Keisha, again, for coming on. And um, if you want to follow this channel, we are at theconservativetake.com. Check us out there. And also, if you want to check out some other content we have right here, please do so. And I'll see you guys next time.